few more minutes. Uh, people, participants are coming online and we'll start shortly. A very warm uh, good afternoon to everybody and um, welcome to this webinar on worsening food crisis um, and exploring possibilities for a partnership between government, the Solidarity Fund and progressive civil society. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an academic at uh, Wits University, but that's not the hat I'm wearing here this afternoon. I chair the board of the Cooperative and Policy Alternative Center. COPAC has been a grassroots NGO working around democratic systemic alternatives for the past 21 years in South Africa. Um, I'm also wearing the hat uh, of uh, an activist in the South African food sovereignty campaign. And I just want to say a little bit about the SAFC because it leads straight into into the discussion this afternoon. Uh, South African Food Sovereignty Campaign came out of a national dialogue in 2014 and a right to food conference, where there was a very serious recognition that the food system in South Africa is broken and that we have a very, very serious food crisis in the country. In 2015, we had a hunger tribunal involving the Human Rights Commission and faith-based communities to bear witness uh, to testimony received. In 2017, in the midst, sorry, in 2016, in the midst of the drought, we also saw food prices going up and we had a bread march to draw attention to the worsening food crisis in the country. In 2017, we recognized that the corporate control food system was failing to feed our country despite claims of food security, but we also saw it collapse in various parts of the system. And so we developed a People's Food Sovereignty Act in 2017 which we then took to parliament in 2018. And the idea was to get the state to think about a different kind of food system. Of course, this was ignored. It was taken to six other ministries as well, and of course ignored. But the idea was that we, we, we avoid going into a catastrophic situation in which people pay the price and nature. Despite that, when COVID hit, I think many of us in the food sovereignty campaign space understood that the scale and magnitude of the problem was big. Uh, we have about 30 million people in South Africa that fall below the uh, extended or upper bounded poverty line. We also understand that about 14 million people went to bed hungry uh, before COVID-19. And of course, with unemployment, et cetera, and loss of income, this created a very serious crisis in the country. And therefore, our premise was that government wasn't going to be able to solve this problem, but neither was civil society. And therefore, we really needed to work together. That was crucial in, in, in our orientation around COVID-19. Let me also say that um, the president of South Africa has consistently called throughout this period for solidarity, for unity, and for partnership. And from the standpoint of the South African food sovereignty campaign, we have also been attempting to ensure that we move in that direction. So there's four elements that I quickly want to share with you that we consider crucial for a partnership with government, which we've been messaging on, campaigning on during COVID-19. And then I'm gonna open this up for debate. The first element is getting the supermarkets who are making massive amounts of money also play their part in South Africa in terms of solidarity buying and supporting pantries and ethical pricing of goods. It's not enough for some of these supermarkets who are moving in this direction merely to provide vouchers because it takes away a view from how goods are priced. And we also want the military to play their part and the police to play their part in distributing these goods. So that's the first thing we've been beating the drum on and is a crucial, uh, if you like, set of players that we need to work with. The second is the, uh, is the unlocking of the food commons in South Africa. And when we talk about food commons, we are talking about thousands of micro-scale farmers, over 180,000 small-scale farmers. We are talking about uh, subsistence fishers. We are talking about community feeding schemes. Um, we are talking about informal traders, and there's 2.6 million of them. And at least 76% of poor households in South Africa source their food locally. If that commons is closed, which it has been, you're creating a very serious crisis. And we've been arguing consistently that the commons needs to be unlocked so that people can start provisioning locally. And there's a whole set of complications around this, which our panelists will also help us appreciate and understand. The third thing that we've been arguing for is that, and we're gonna hear, we're gonna hear numbers, um, particularly from the Solidarity Fund and so on, about how many parcels 
have been put out. We'll hear from other activists as well about immediate food relief. But our argument is that it's important to broaden that network and that base of food relief actors, given the scale of the problem. The fourth very important element in the framework we've been arguing for is a substantive citizen's basic income grant. Now we've got the COVID relief grant, we've got top ups of grants in the pipeline. This is wholly inadequate given the food crisis in South Africa. So in short, our view is that if we are going to find balance between the public health response on the one hand, and on the other hand, socioeconomic mitigation, we have to find a serious approach to the food problem and crisis, as well as the loss of income. Now, to help us kind of test this kind of framework and to have further debate on these issues, we've lined up a very, very important panel. Yesterday, I had a telephonic conversation with the Minister of Social Development. She is very, very keen on this engagement. She was willing to acknowledge that there were serious challenges around this process. She was also willing to acknowledge that government doesn't have all the answers. We also don't have all the answers. And hence, the, I think we found common ground on the need to deepen this dialogue and to search for a, a common solidarity framework, if you like. Unfortunately, and the minister wanted to be on the poster, she wanted to be on the panel, but unfortunately, she, she couldn't make it this afternoon. Uh, but that doesn't mean, and she has other commitments, some of them related to parliament, as I understand it. But that doesn't mean the conversation is going to end here. The door is open. And after this webinar, there's going to be further engagement with the minister and other key players around securing this partnership. But to kick off things this afternoon, I'm going to hand over to Dora Marema. Dora Marema is a, is a board member of COPAC. She also leads Gender CC. They've been doing amazing grassroots work around food relief. And so she's going to bring a particular perspective uh, to the issues. We've asked all panelists, including the minister, if she was here, to talk about how they understand the food crisis, what they've been doing, what are the challenges, what do they see as possibilities for partnership and how we can get there. Dora, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Vish, for this um, opportunity. I do not really take it lightly. Um, uh, uh, we have been really excited to hear that the minister was willing to come and participate in this um, webinar. Um, nevertheless, I think the, the, you know, the, the webinar will, will go forward and hopefully our, our messages and the views that we will share here will be able to reach her and other members of that um, Command Council. Uh, I think just to kick off, everybody you know, really have seen the cues, they have had the frustrations um, from everyone who has been participating in um, alleviating the hunger that is ravaging our communities during the lockdown. And there have been various efforts. We have been um, participating in, um, in alleviating that pressure by working with small scale producers in the communities um, to be able to supply um, produce and, and, and fresh uh, vegetables to their, to their own communities. Um, in a way, working on a bigger vision to try map out um, uh, these, these small scale producers in the communities and, and really develop short food uh, supply systems that will exist post COVID. Um, however, the, the current regulations of government to clamp down on the work that has been done by civil society brought a lot of frustration from last week when we started getting um, uh, um, indication that the government would like NGOs to apply for 48 hours to DSD officials and subs and, it, and disclose the contents of the food packages. Um, it, you know, and also the whole clamping down and closing down of uh, food kitchens that are run by churches that have been doing it for many decades and feeding the many homeless that are not able to access electricity and homes to be able to cook um, the, the, the raw food that, that can be supplied. Um, and I think what we have seen is a, the heavy handed approach of government and really antagonizing um, the people that have been in the forefront of doing the work. And I think I'm not representing the entire civil society here. I am representing my own organizations uh, that have been doing work. And I think I'd like to express the general feeling of the people that I've been talking to who are, some of them are part of C19, some of them are not, um, that uh, we definitely acknowledge the challenge of trying to make sure that we flatten the curve, that we do not perpetuate the 
um, the, 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 the spread of COVID-19. However, we believe that there, is, there are other ways of doing this. So definitely we do not, you know, we, 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 we absolutely reject the approach that DSD has taken to now centralize um, the provision of the, of the food parcels. Uh, also to close down the, 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 the food kitchens and the soup kitchens that have been existing um, uh, for, a, for a very long time. Um, and actually, in, in a way, coercing organizations um, to be able to, to provide the food that they have raised the resources for um, to the DSD lists, uh, who we know they are not inclusive of the people who are undocumented in this country. Um, and that the NGOs and the civil society have been playing a big role in the churches in making sure that those people are also able to be fed. And um, so for me, that's, that's a very, you know, very concerning uh, 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 situation that we see in our country. Um, as we are able, trying to adhere to these rules by applying to DSD and SAPS to get permissions to deliver the food within 48 hours and there's no response, what do we do? Um, we will see a lot of people going to bed hungry and we'll see a revolt of our people because um, we, we are concerned that our people will definitely die from hunger before COVID-19 reached them. And what, what, what are we supposed to be doing? And I think there are ways that we could be able to do this. DSD could be able to play a role together with SAPS, not to police um, the, 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 organize, the, the civil society when they, when they provide the food, but actually to provide support to make sure that the places where the food is being handed out, there is social distancing, um, instead of saying everything has to be closed down, has to go through us, and, and, and if not, then nothing else. Um, for me, I find it very uh, offensive to our people um, and really undermining the freedom um, of this country. And I think if uh, the, the, the DSD are not also uh, cautious about um, what the minister is putting out there, words like tightening, you know, the screws and using this very offensive language that will get many, many people who've been really wanting to join hands with the government to provide for many of our, our, our people, millions, who are not able to access the food currently. We will see a, a serious pushback and a serious revolt. The other issue is about uh, what the Solidarity Fund is doing, providing um, all these much needed resources our concern is who are the people that are buying the food for, uh, the food that they are providing the packages for. Um, and also, are they recognizing the fact that uh, there's already a, a, a compromise in terms of small producers? Retailers have been open all the time during the lockdown. They have been benefiting. Uh, what is the Solidarity Fund through the organizations that they are supporting doing to making sure that the small players are also benefiting? Um, so this is something that uh, I would like to put onto the table as we start this conversation, that there are other ways that we could be doing this that would make sure that our communities are sustainable and are, sustain, are being sustained beyond COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Dora. Um, I'm going to bring in uh, Des Dessa. Des is a renowned activist and leader in South Africa, and uh, he's been fighting uh, climate and environmental justice battles in the Durban area for many, many years. Uh, Des works with subsistence fishes, um, I think about 12,000 of them, uh, but he's going to bring a very important dimension into our conversation. Des, over to you. So, um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. good, thanks. Um, well, it's good to see old comrades like Dora and Mervyn I haven't seen for a long time. Nice to see you guys, and uh, good to see the fight still carries on. And while Vish and Jane are always on talks and discussions, and Tim, I don't know, so probably get to know about Tim today. Um, I belong to the South Durban Community Environmental Alliance, but I also belong to the Coalition of the Poor in Durban. So I'm going to take off my environmental hat for a second, Vish, although it's all linked. Environmental justice and human rights are one and the same, and food security and food sovereignty, and everything we talk about is one and the same. But I'd rather talk about the coalition that represents um, the 10 hostels in Durban, uh, where we've got about 400,000 people. Uh, the Shack Dwellers Abashadi, uh, Basim John Dolo, the biggest Shack Dwellers movement in Durban. Um, the Fisher Folks, that represent over 30,000 subsistence fisher folks, 12,000 in Durban and all on our coastline, subsistence farmers, but also the informal traders, uh, the migrant communities, 
the street traders, the market users, and all poor communities that form part of the coalition in Durban that we've been working together on the last couple of three years. The issue is that poverty has gone worse since the lockdown. Food is not getting to people. People in hostels are hungry. They're getting absolutely nothing. They are living at, the, and most of these people that live in hostels and shacks are casual workers. All the workers that shut them down were casual workers. Some of them are informal traders that sell food on the streets. That has all been stopped. The fisher folks have been fishing for since time immemorial, hundreds of years on our coastline and in the harbor. We won a 10 year battle in 2014. That's all shut down without any discussion. The people I'm talking about don't get, are not getting any assistance from government at all. The fisher folks, um, the people with commercial boats that are supplying the fish factories and the canneries in Cape Town and the Northern Cape, they're all working, they've all been allowed to fish. They've got 48 uh, people and a number of uh, co-ops, just six co-ops in our province that are operating, very few people. And from those co-ops, most of, most of the people on those co-ops are rich people. So the fishermen that I represent, subsistence, they poor, they fish for a living. They fish to take food home every day. They fish to go and sell some of that food so they can put other essentials on the table. They've been deprived of that. There's no assistance. We've been trying to talk to government at national level, at DEF. We've been talking to government at provincial level. Absolutely no assistance. They shift you from one pillar to the next. The last couple of weeks have been very frustrating. Eventually, we went to the presidency. We received a letter from the presidency. Your, your matter is receiving attention two weeks ago and nothing more. So people have to stay for two weeks without no food, have to go to bed hungry. Their children are hungry. There's nobody that we can get hold of and talk to. That is the problem. No one wants to listen. No one wants to talk to, and if, they, if you do get somebody, they pass the buck on to the next person. In two days, I went through speak to over 15 people in different departments. And finally, they told me I must go to a person in Cape Town, the director of fisheries in Cape Town, Sue Middleton. I've tried to get all of her today. I couldn't get all of her. Her juniors, I got all of him. After a day and night trying to get all of him until late yesterday, I got all of him, in, him this morning. And still, no response to how they're going to deal with this fisherman. Because you must remember, subsistence fishermen have been social distancing for years, the rod and reel fishermen. They can't fish together. They can't stand together because you won't be able to cast. If you're not fishing, you won't be able to cast your rod. And yet they're not allowed to fish. But those on boats can, that are very close together can fish together and they won't be affected with coronavirus. You're going to see what's going to happen there. That's where CEO 1919 is going to come from. Those on the coastline that have been deprived of fishing are really, that should never have happened. They should have been a proper and meaningful consultation with people, and we could have told them what is required and what is needed. We could have provided the mask and the things for those fishermen. But there are social distancing. It's not a sport of contact. It's not a contact sport. And yet they've been deprived of fishing for a livelihood and taking on food. Now they've, for all their lives, they've sent their children to school through fishing. They've educated their kids. They put food on the table, they paid for services. Now they've got to beg for a living, they go standing food queues because government is not prepared to help them. And they're not even getting any assistance at all. So I think government, whilst government, yesterday I heard the story from the MECs, MEC um, uh, uh, Dube, Nomsa Dube, She's from economics. You know what she said when I confronted them on the, on the Zoom call about the fishermen in Durban, I said, but you know, fishermen are deprived. She said, well, fishing is not banned. But why isn't that message then escalated to all officials, to the police? Because that's where they have been. Fishermen have been arrested for fishing for a livelihood without no one consulting them. The chairperson of the Caseland Subsistence Fishermen, they came with five vehicles at his house to pick him up and never charged him but arrest him and threaten him. It's the old apartheid system in uh, coming back to haunt us. We're secure gates, where they pick up people, they threaten you, they fight with you, and then they interrogate you, and then they say at the end, after about a few hours, okay, now you can go. It's a, it's a system coming back, 
And if we're not careful, this will affect the country. Democracy will be a threat. This is what's happening to our poor people, to poor fishermen. This is what's happening to shack dwellers. Their homes are being broken in Durban. They're not giving a break from that, even that. So the COVID virus, they talk about, oh, you must, uh, you must uh, uh, social distance. You must wash your hands. They break their homes, they break their water, they destroy everything. How can people be treated worse than even animals are treated in this country? This is the problem we are facing. And if we don't stand up and speak out against it, we are going to find at the end of the day, our civil liberties will be undermined, be taken away right under our nose. Never did I ever expect that I would be hard and fast and speak very firm about these issues. When I can see poverty, I live in an area where there's a lot of poverty. I see it in the fishermen's faces. I've never seen grown-up old men crying. I've never seen people, their families crying, like what I've seen now. And I think we need to really organize properly around the country so that we all can come together and say, we can't accept this. Yes, we understand the coronavirus is a deadly disease. We understand it clearly. We understand that it kills people. We understand it because we see people getting, killing, getting killed in our community. But poverty is also killing our people. Violence is killing our people. Human rights abuses are killing our people. And I think that's important, that we should not allow that to happen, what has happened in the past, that it repeats itself once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Des. Um... I'm going to bring in uh, Mervyn Abrahams um, from Peter Maritzburg Economic Justice and Dignity uh, NGO. Uh, they've been doing amazing work uh, for years, um, tracking food prices in South Africa. And they've also been campaigning and engaging um, around the COVID crisis and food. Mervyn, over to you. Thank you, Vish, and thank you for the opportunity to engage uh, on this platform. Um, the angle that I will take, and of course the angle uh, that the Peter Maritzburg Economic Justice and Dignity works from, um, is that the majority of South African households holders are net buyers of food. And being net buyers of food, uh, the issue around the affordability of food therefore determines uh, the access and the level of household food security uh, in the country. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. A new system doesn't have to be that way, but that is what we are engaged in currently. Okay. And so affordability, how much money we have in our pockets and the prices of food are determinative of whether households are suffering hunger uh, or not. So let us just look at the uh, price increases that we have seen over the last three months, uh, just from before the lockdown to the 1st of May. The food basket has 38 foods, very basic foods like rice, maize meal, flour, sugar, cooking oil, some vegetables and some meat. Now, in the last three months, we have seen this basket increase by 249 rand and 92 cents. So that's 7.8% from 3,221 rand to 3,470 rand and 92 cents as the 1st of May. So that is a massive increase. I mean, when we look, for instance, at the increase in the old age pension grant, um, that increase was 250 rand. Um, so essentially by now that increase has been taken off the shelf. I mean, an, a, a household living of an old age pension uh, to purchase their food would be now in exactly the same place where they were pre-lockdown. We've also seen, because we also track a small basket of household, domestic, and personal hygiene. And there we have also seen an increase of roughly about 7%. So the increases we have seen by and large are, just to mention a few, are mainly in the core foods. So things like rice has increased by 26%, flour by 3%, sugar by 6%, cooking oil by 11%, 
white bread by 15% and brown bread by 14%. And then we also saw major increases in fresh vegetables, like potatoes by 8%, onions by 58%, spinach by 13 and cabbage by 22%. Part of this increase in the cost of vegetables is directly connected to the absence of the informal traders being able to operate in our townships and on our streets. Because the women tell us that they would prefer to buy from the informal traders for one, their prices are much more affordable. Two, that they allow you to buy in quantities that the supermarkets would not allow you to buy in. And three, they have formed a relationship of trust with the informal traders. So we have seen that part of this increase in, in, in cost are directly connected to the absence uh, of informal traders not being uh, on the streets to trade. When we are looking in terms of affordability, of course, then we are seeing that prices and incomes are of critical importance. Uh, when we look at the cost of our basket, which is 3,470 Rand, and compare this with just some form of income, the median wage in South Africa is somewhere in the region of about between 3,200 and 3,500. The, the national minimum wage is at 3,500. So you can already see that households are not able to afford uh, a, a basket of basic food. When we look at the coronavirus grant, great that we have received that grant, but when we look at 350, we see what can you buy with that? Essentially, you can buy a loaf of brown bread for each day of the month. That is where that would take us. The child support grant increase of 300 Rand does not really make that much of a difference because the cost to feed a child has increased uh, to something in the region of 678 Rand. Um, and of course, children uh, don't live by themselves. They live as part of the household. And so that grant in any case uh, helps to cover the, the food needs of the entire household. If I might just very quickly go on and uh, move a bit away from the figures and uh, share with what are we seeing on the ground? What are women telling us on the ground? The first thing is that food has never been affordable. And so the COVID-19 has only deepened hunger, but hunger has existed before COVID-19. Food has not been affordable and it continues not to be affordable. They also tell us that while before the lockdown, their food might have lasted for about three weeks uh, of the month, the last week being a very, very bad week in households. Now food only lasts for two weeks because the children are at home and many uh, uh, everybody is at home and so more people are eating. So that is important to know that food only lasts roughly around two weeks. That the increases in the social grants are not enough to meet their food needs. Furthermore, they tell us that the uh, restrictions, the lockdown restrictions have greatly impacted on their ability to shop. So one example is that women tell us that the queues are massively long and because the queues are massively long, they need to get into the store as quickly as they can, do the shopping that they can and then try and get the taxi back home. What is the implication of this is that women can no longer go from store to store looking for specials in order to stretch their budget. And so they are almost a captive audience now to the corporate sector. What can we do? I think the first thing that we, we would like to recommend is firstly, that we need to look at the cost of the food parcels that are being distributed. We have heard of food parcels being distributed of 1,200, 1,500 and 1,700. When we look at the cost for a household of seven, it is 3,470. So these food parcels are not sufficient 
to feed a family. Secondly, if food only lasts for about two weeks, that means that these parcel distribution needs to happen at least every two weeks, if not more often than that. Um, thirdly, what we would like to say is that this whole thing here around regulations, we have heard of households being told that they do not qualify for a food parcel from DST because they have an income of 1,800 Rand or an income of 3,600 Rand. Our research shows that if a household has an income of 3,600 Rand, then that household is in poverty, that household is suffering hunger, and that household definitely requires that food parcel. Food parcels, of course, as you have said, which, which we totally agree with, are merely an emergency response. Really what we require is a transformed food system that brings food closer to the home, that prioritizes the informal sector, uh, and that allows uh, uh, the fishers and the informal and the small-scale farmers a much bigger role in our food sector and not only the corporate sector. Thank you. We can carry on with some others in discussions afterwards. Thank you so much, Mervyn, for those insights, powerful insights into how hunger is really kind of working in households. Uh, I'm going to bring in um, Tim Abba, who's a small scale farmer, and he's been working uh, with farming issues for about 10 years in South Africa. And he's been doing a lot of food relief work on the ground. Tim, are you there? Tim, mm. we might be having a technical problem with Tim. Okay, I'm going to move on to Anoki Parikh, who works at the Solidarity Fund. Uh, Anoki has been one of the frontline people engaged in the food relief effort uh, within the Solidarity Fund. And uh, thank you so much for making the time and for coming on to this platform to find sort of a common framework for partnership. Over to you, Anoki. You need to, um, you need to unmute. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, somehow never gets this, never gets old, this kind of muting yourself thing. Um, thanks everyone for inviting me uh, to this panel. It's a real honor to be here uh, and, and amongst a group of people who have obviously been working on these issues for, for decades. Um, as Vishwa said, my name is Anoki and I'm here in my capacity as the program manager for the food relief program at the Solidarity Fund. And I'm here to share um, what we have done so far and our thinking behind it, uh, recognizing that it's kind of step one. Uh, and I'm also, more importantly, I'm actually here to listen and get input about how the fund might shape its thinking in the coming months. And I'm glad we're in agreement that we don't all have the answers uh, and agree wholeheartedly that this is, this is about kind of creating Netbooks of Solidarity to address the scale of the challenge at hand. So in terms of the presentation, I have some kind of slides up uh, just to, to kind of help um, the, the points and the data land. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'd like to provide some context about the fund's overall mandate, because I think it, it sets the stage for, for the type of work, the type of collaboration uh, that, that, that would be kind of most fruitful. Uh, the second is to spend most of this discussion uh, diving into the uh, into sort of uh, what we did in food relief. And then the third is to uh, close out with some reflections on opportunities for partnership. So I'm going to share my screen now and uh, hopefully there should be no challenges with that. Just give me a second. Um, can people see my screen? Yeah, great. Brilliant. Um, okay, so just to, just to kind of overview, I guess we all know that the, the fund was announced on 23rd March uh, by President Ramaphosa um, to unite the nation in our response to the crisis. Um, and, you know, in reality, the fund is really only five or six weeks old um, and, and has, of course, a sort of very large mandate. Um, there's three things I'd like to kind of emphasize about the fund. So the first is that it's critical to note that we are a rapid response vehicle and that our mandate is to be fast. Um, the second is that we are responding to the COVID crisis. And so a lot of our work is, is really, you know, short term in nature. Um, you know, we don't see ourselves as being, uh, you know, here for, for years to come. Uh, and then the third is we are independent. So while we are partnering with government, with business and with civil society, we are independently administered. Um, 
And so in, the, in that context, I think that sort of tells us sort of what, you know, I, I think that this kind of helps us narrow down the, the, uh, the space for collaboration between, between us. Um, there are three, the fund has three focus areas. Um, the first is uh, health response, which is the bulk of our disbursement. Um, this disbursement has focused largely around the procurement of PPE for frontline healthcare workers, including community health workers, uh, the procurement of test kits, and the procurement of ventilators. This is, as you can see on the slide, 70, 70 to 75 percent of our planned disbursement, uh, and a, a very large number of disbursements have already been made, and, and, and the, these kind of uh, this PPE has been ordered, and some of it is being manufactured locally. Um, the, the second pillar is the humanitarian effort, and, and food relief falls under this. Um, we have only made one disbursement within humanitarian, effort, uh, humanitarian relief to date, which is on food, which I will discuss in a minute. Um, but obviously, in the, coming, in the coming months, we'd want to think about what else we might be able to do. So there are kind of discussions around uh, the importance of the Solidarity Fund responding to the rise in gender-based violence, for example. Uh, or thinking about what the next phase of food relief could look like. And, and I'd, I'd love to get input from the, from the group on this. And then finally, the third is the Solidarity Campaign, which is essentially a campaign that will unite the nation in action against COVID. And it's sort of, you know, around behavior change and understanding kind of how to respond and be in this new world that we are all living in with social distancing and, and staying at home and, and, and all the rest. Um, uh, and especially as the economy hopefully reopens uh, what that kind of means for our, uh, our health. So that's the, the overall kind of structure of, of, of the fund at the moment. Um, I think with, with that in mind, I'll spend the rest of the discussion on, dis uh, on, on food relief. And I guess it's important for us to understand how we framed the problem and what our entry point was into that problem. And you know, wholeheartedly agree and understand the scale of food insecurity in South Africa, even prior to COVID. Um, and, you know, the general household survey saying that 4 million South African households experience some form of food insecurity um, and 1 million acute food insecurity. And, and we know that by limiting people's incomes, the COVID lockdown has exacerbated this food insecurity crisis. Um, and everyone, everyone that's spoken to date has, has only added kind of a really important Kind of detail and depth to that statement. Um, but in the context of what the fund did, uh, when the lockdown was announced about uh, five weeks ago, I don't even know how many, time moves very in strange ways these days, um, uh, the government was, we, we know as a fund, we were sort of in, our view is that the government was putting together clear relief measures in place to address the unprecedented challenge at an unprecedented scale. And, and they were working towards just developing a systemic solution to support households via grants. And we, of course, we didn't know all the details, but we knew that those grants were hopefully going to come in, and, and they did come online. And of course, the question about whether they're sufficient or not is a separate one. Um, but, but in that moment, which was literally the day that the lockdown was announced, um, or in the week, the, week the, the two weeks that followed the lockdown announcement, the fund, and like everyone else, I guess, expected a rising hunger crisis and made a decision to disperse 120 million rand towards immediate food relief to be rolled out through the lockdown period. Um, and, and I think that this is important to know because the, this food relief would be directed as a stopgap measure while the other systems kind of came online. And we were aware that our food relief is not necessarily a systemic solution, it is relief. Um, and that actually when we're thinking about longer term systemic solutions, we would look into our, our next phases of work to think about what that might look like. So it's also important to note, I guess, that in the scheme of the scale of the food, food crisis, 120 million rand is, 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 is a small amount. Um, it's a large amount for the Solidarity Fund, it's a large amount in general, uh, but if we're talking about millions of households experiencing food insecurity, um, you know, we are, we are just a small player in this and, and you know, we require, we are a part of a very important part of the solution, but we would need kind of government and civil society to work together to, to really address the scale of the problem. Um, so we arrived upon a few guiding principles for our food response. Um, the first is speed. And I think um, that was because, you know, we were responding to a crisis, a hunger crisis within the lockdown. Uh, and our timelines for this has been days and weeks and not months. Uh, and that is because our mandate was relief. The second is geographic reach. Uh, we 
as a fund that's national in nature, uh, our goal was to reach all nine provinces, of course, and have re very good urban and rural coverage and reach the most deprived municipalities in South Africa. Um, finally, I mean, the resource efficiency was an important part as well. So th that the funds that we would be dispersing towards food would be going to food rather than to distribution and to other kind of ancillary costs. We worked hard to kind of reduce uh, margins wherever possible um, so that, you know, um, we were getting the kind of best best rate uh, on all of these, uh, on, all, um, on these food parcels. Uh, the second, and then finally, I guess, you know, traceability, we need, be able to build, we need to be able to validate delivery to beneficiary households, safety of the distribution, um, and that we would work with a wide range of partners across civil society, private sector, and government. Now, I think one of the things that, that I'd like to come back to towards the end of this discussion is that in the back of our mind, we were thinking about how can this relief effort become part of building a longer term system, right? So over a two or three month timeline, can we leverage the existing food distribution efforts of government, of NGOs, of faith-based organizations, of community-based organizations that are really doing the hard work of reaching vulnerable communities every day? Um, can, we, can we leverage that and bring them together to build last mile distribution platforms for future humanitarian and ongoing kind of crises, right? Um, and this could be kind of the physical distribution. It could also be thinking about, you know, mechanisms to reach people through cash or vouchers. Um, it could be about linking smallholder farmers uh, who, are, who are struggling to get their produce to market and informal vendors that are critical to household food security. It could be about ensuring the circulation of cash in the local economy. But it, what's important is that while we're thinking about this, that the timeline of, for this work is, is longer, right? It's not a kind of three week <laughs> timeline. And, and that food relief disbursement would be the critical kind of first step of that. Um, so I'd like to come back to that kind of uh, towards the end of this conversation about what we might be able to do to build that out. So what we did was we had a kind of four pillar uh, distribution strategy. Um, we distributed parcels to 250,000 households through government and civil society. Um, about 25% of that happened through uh, the Department of Social Development CNDC centers, uh, the community, community um, nutrition and development centers that there are 235 of across South Africa and they feed amongst the most vulnerable households uh, in the country. Um, their operations were affected by lockdown and we were kind of supporting, we entered into a partnership with, with the Department of Social Development to uh, provide food parcels um, to, to those households. 75% of our disbursement actually happened through NGOs, CBOs and faith-based organizations. So um, we, the, the second pillar of our work was to work with large food nonprofits such as Food Forward South Africa, Islamic Relief, Lunchbox Fund, and Africa Tukun. There are four that we worked with um, to reach households across nine provinces. Um, and each of, these each of these organizations has their own uh, network of community-based organizations that they usually serve. Um, they have different ways of um, uh, buying food um, and, and, and buy it from different kind of sources. But essentially, you know, bulk of our kind of distribution took place through these four, four large N NPOs. Um, and then we identified some kind of critical gap areas in terms of geographic reach. Uh, we had like not sufficient reach in rural areas through the first and second approach. And we worked with community-based and faith-based organizations to reach those households. And I think that a lot of kind of organizations that, um, you know, some of you might know, like the Association for Rural Advancement, we gave you know, a few, uh, few thousand parcels to the C19 People's Coalition in Kauteng and Western Cape, Hope Africa, uh, Rural Democracy Trust, Shlanganisa, Community Chest. I mean, there's, there's a long list of partners and, and we will publish those partners uh, on the, uh, online shortly on our website. And then finally, um, we had the fourth pillar, which is around vouchers. And, and here, I think the, you know, this pillar is really anchored around experimentation and building better systems, um, in addition to obviously providing immediate relief. And it came from the recognition that it's better to give people choice to determine what they need um, and have solutions that put cash back into the local economy. And so in this regard, we have partnered with the SACC, um, who through their local ecumenical network have identified vulnerable populations that they'd like to serve with a variety of voucher and cash transfer options. 
um, we recognize that very that not many of the options are kind of meet all our requirements. There are obviously there are, there are a bunch of options that are big retail only. There's some options that are spaza only but are not integrated into a big retailer solution. Um, and so we're sort of experimenting and trying to find options and integrations, you know, options, ways to integrate these solutions to give beneficiaries um, the most amount of choice. Um, and certainly would love inputs from the group here about what kind of experimentation would be useful here. So that's kind of how we, we did the, the food parcel delivery. And, and we've aimed for, you know, countrywide coverage. Um, that's the kind of map of what we had planned. Um, it doesn't, it's not a complete map. There are areas that we are cover, covering that are not, um, uh, not clearly indicated on this map. So for example, we do actually have coverage in Beaufort West, but it's not on this map. But essentially you can see that we've kind of tried our level best uh, to reach you know, wide, a wide range of South Africans across the nine provinces. Um, and yeah, and so this is our current status. Um, these are the deliveries that have been completed. Uh, 232,000 parcels have been delivered to households across the country and 250,000 parcels, which is our target, have been distributed to middle mile, which means to the community-based organizations and basically out for delivery to households within the coming days. Um, I just wanted to close on kind of opportunities for collaboration. So one of the things, as I mentioned, is thinking about inclusive sort of last mile systems, and that includes building out inclusive su supply chains and payment solutions. Um, so getting, uh, finding ways to distribute cash, finding ways to bring in smallholder farmers whose produce is not making it to market. How can we leverage, um, you know, the, the, the large kind of logistics capability that we have actually almost demonstrated through this first phase of work to, to, you know, to, build, a, to build a different system, right? Um, and I think that, that uh, you know, this is a big question for us and we'd, we'd like to think about what specifically our role would be within that, given that it's a, it's, it's a sort of a big undertaking. Um, the second would be to think about a coordination platform for future relief efforts or even, I guess, ongoing food relief efforts. Uh, the Solidarity Fund finds itself in a kind of, as an independent body, um, in a good place for being at that sort of central coordinating point um, for both civil society, private sector, and government. And so, um, you know, we're, we're curious to hear what role we might be able to play. And, and finally, I know that there's plenty of other ideas that have been raised here. Um, you know, in terms of food relief, we're also thinking about what, what, what role does kind of food, food, do food gardens have? Um, how can we think about procurement differently? I think those are questions that, that are on, on our mind and, and we'd love your input. And then finally, I would say that I think that there's a what and then there's the how, there's a what you do and then there's a how you do it. And um, it would be helpful to get inputs from this room around what the kind of institutional form or process of that collaboration could look like. Um, so that so that things can move quickly. So I will pause there and uh, I presume that there's time for questions later. Yes, thank you very much uh, for that openness and sharing and transparency uh, and even accountability um, because you know it's public money and donations and, and so this input into this platform is very, very welcome. Uh, I'm going to try and bring in uh, Tim Abba. Tim, are you there? He's a small scale farmer. Yes, can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Go for it, Tim. Thank you. I think I want to echo all the sentiments of the previous speakers. Myself, from a farmer's perspective, because I'm a small farmer and we deal with farmers every day. With Doras Green Business College, we have been providing farmer culture and agroecology training to the smallholder farmers within the whole country, you know. So after the lockdown was announced, it came as a shock to most farmers. One, most of the fresh produce, because we farm with seasons. Now, most of the fresh produce were ready for market. And as you know, all the traders, informal traders in town, all the restaurants had to be closed down. Most of the farmers had optic arguments. It means like the perishable goods now had to perish. So there was no clear planning on if we announce the lockdown, what's the plan B for the farmers? People must eat. The shopping centers, if they pick and pay or shop right, they buy, you will have to go to with the price, you know. So 
most of the farmers, they were vulnerable. Most of them, their fresh produce were getting perished. So we say, how do we help these farmers? And most of the families, you know, they were left without income. So we had to come up with a plan of us purchasing fresh produce from the farmers and donate the poor and needy families. That's number one. Number two, most of the farmers, they need inputs like seeds. Compost. You know, I can pay the seed sections. I think the government did not have a good planning on that part because if you say there's a lockdown, some of these seeds, seedling compost, these are essential services. We need to continue farming. Yes, people might be on lockdown, but the stomachs must be recharged two, three times a day. So I think from that point of view, I I'm not sure about now because even now farmers are still struggling. Our agriculture extension officers, they are not on the ground. You call them and ask them, guys, do you have any seeds for the farmers? Do you have any resources? They say, no, we don't have anything. They will tell you our procurement, there's nothing happening because it's lockdown. I think from that, that point of view, there is something lacking. So with us, we had to start the Ubuntu project because most of people are coming and complaining, we are poor, we don't have food, we are struggling. Then we start to give them a box of fresh produce of which got spinach, beetroot, cabbage, peppers, tomatoes, potatoes, six eggs, dry beans, and some soaps, honey, lettuce, cucumber, for them to eat, you know, to keep them going. It's not sustainable. But then we say, how is sustainable to the farmers, to the community members, to keep them going? Can we give them things like seeds, seedlings, compost, and a garden magazine, you know? You can only teach someone how to fish, then he can feed himself for the rest of his life. Then on top of the fresh produce box, we started giving them what we call the Ubuntu gardening starter pack, of which got like 50 seedlings, two packets of winter crop seeds, one packet of herb, and then we got 20 kg of compost. And above all, there's a training guide on gardening. Because now you can't run workshops during the lockdown. So when we go to their homes, you engage them like 20 minutes. This is spinach. This is how you grow it, how to plant it and stuff, the care. So it got all the information inside there. Fun enough, you... What's happening? Tim, I'm, I'm sorry, we, 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 we lost you there. And I'm just a bit worried about time. Tim? Okay. I think, we, I think we're gonna leave it there with Tim and I'm sure if he gets plugged in again, uh, we can bring him into the conversation. Uh, there's been some great uh, feedback on the chat stream as well and some very, very important issues. So I just want to kind of zoom in on some of these things so we have a, a broader conversation. So many comments relate to uh, the reach of food parcels. And, um, and, you know, it's clear that not everybody's targeted and so on. So, you know, and that's a very serious issue. Uh, Mervyn's point was very, very important about uh, about the costing around uh, food parcels. The fact that we need food parcels that actually, uh, if it's three thousand four hundred, only last two weeks, uh, you're going to have a you're going to have to have a, a follow through, a second round of distribution, etc. So this is this is on a on a massive massive scale. So. One of the one of the contributions that has come through is that we need to um, coordinate, we need to decentralize, but I'd like to open this up to the panel just on the immediate food relief issue and getting parcels out there. What are your thoughts on this issue? Who would like to go first? I mean, I don't want to put Anoki in the seat to solve this problem. It's a common problem. We all have to grapple with this challenge. 
and all put our strengths and weight into this. So who would like to step up? Around food relief parcels and how do we make this work? If we assume we're gonna be working together. Yeah, I can, I can come in uh, first. Sure, here. sure, Dora. Um, for me, the, one of the urgent things is really for the DSD to lift up the ban on, uh, on kitchens, right? And soup kitchens. Uh, that's like an immediate thing because um, by closing these facilities, you're already closing many millions who don't have access to homes to be able to prepare the meals. People are starving. Let's get them the food. Um, if we are concerned about the, the scare of, um, of spreading the, the virus, then let's bring in assistance from government, from DSD and, 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 and others to be able to make sure that uh, there is social distancing while the food has been, has been delivered. Let's also lift up the 48-hour request for permission to distribute, right? Um, what, why, why are we doing this? Are we not happy with the way that um, civil society has been doing this thing? Let's come together instead of um, just issuing in more, more and more regulations uh, because we know that government alone is not able to reach the many people that are, that are starving. We don't, we don't expect that from them. We know that the resources are not enough. Uh, why don't we hold hands together and actually look at what are the challenges that government has has noticed um, within civil society food distribution schemes and be able to iron those out. Let's not also push the DSD lists on uh, civil society. Um, we, you know, DSD, let, let DSD take care of its own lists. And because we, we, we even have people who are supposedly on DSD lists who are still starving. And the civil society is also inundated with requests. Um, and we are raising resources that are not specifically uh, from government. And we are not expecting DSD to come up with miracles, but also at the same time, we need DSD to be reasonable um, about the, some of these regulations that are putting forward. If there's no way that we could be able to, to get our people to wait while we are waiting for a 48 hour uh, um, permission to be issued by SAPS and DSD. They don't have enough capacity to be able to deal with this. Just another case in point, the issue of the 350 COVID-19 um, uh, um, um, grant that has been issued, it, it has to be done online. Many people have attempted, they're not, able to, 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 they're not able to reach that. In the meantime, while they're still waiting to get onto the list, they need to be eat, they need to be eating, they need to eat. Like Tim was saying, their stomach doesn't, doesn't wait. Uh, there are also other issues like um, the issue of uh, child support grants that support pay, caregiver. What about a woman who's got four children? They've been supplementing that child support care grant by doing domestic work and they're no longer able to do it right now. They are starving. I think in the midst of, of DSD sorting out its other challenges, uh, like these grants I've mentioned, they must allow civil society to continue providing the food, of course, within the regulations of people being um, uh, a, a social distancing, of, of, of wearing protective clothing to make sure that there is no spread. So for me, that, that is one of the most urgent things. Let's lose the screws. Let's not tighten the screws. Thank you. Excellent, Dora. Uh, anybody else wants to come in around how we rise to this challenge of immediate food relief? Mervyn, your thoughts? Um, yes, could I, could I, could I uh, go back to the idea around, um, I mean, I fully agree with what uh, 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 Dora has said just before me. Building on that uh, is this whole issue, when we come to DSD, uh, the times that the lists are taking. I mean, people are just uh, giving up on, on, on that request. So therefore, the churches should be allowed to do some stuff. Um, but I, we have a big problem with, with who qualifies for what. And we think that the qualifications that are being set up, the regulations around who qualifies for, for what, um, really should just be done away with. And we should use the proxy of, of, of value of homes. I mean, it's not unheard of in other parts of the world where governments will go into a particular area and say this area, because of the cost of housing is extremely low, we can therefore presume that everyone in this area is poor and then just do that and just roll out the food that we can. So that's another area I think that DSD needs to review and, and uh, it could get food into the hands of those who need it much, much quicker. Um, perhaps also uh, for a later stage, 
we could also talk around price controls and 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 increases uh, uh, in food cost at retail levels. Thank you, Mervyn. Uh, anybody else wants to come in around how we make food relief work? There's the point about democratizing this process, uh, dialogue, uh, working with communities. Um, this is a very, very important point. So for example, Des, I mean, are y'all organized enough amongst the fisher folk and subsistence fishers to be able to say, you can work with the Solidarity Fund and get this relief out? No, we certainly can. We are organized, we are not for profit, we are registered with social department. We have people all along the coastline that are fishing, that live in communities, so we are well organized. I must also add also as well as coalition of the poor. The Shack Dwellers Movement, the biggest movement in South Africa based in Durban, are well organized, their leaders are well known, they know their people. The hostel dwellers, likewise, they know their people, they live amongst the people. Bringing in NGOs and groups that don't live in, amongst people is where the problem becomes because it's politicized. And I think we need to shift away the distribution point to people that are leaders in their own communities, that work in their communities, that represent their people in those communities. So fisher folk, for example, we have a list of names, thousands of fisher folk and their leaders all along the coastline and in the suburbs and townships of Durban. Likewise with the shack dwellers. They've got their leaders, they've got their representatives in every formal shack, 500 shack dwellers in Durban, in shack. They've got leaders in those communities. Same thing with the hostels, same thing with the informal traders. So if you go to the leaders, you get rid of the politicizing and who gets and who doesn't get. In fact, it goes directly to poor people. It gives them the relief, it removes the hunger, and it provides meals for them and their families on the table. And we, it's a win-win situation. We are willing to work with government on that. We think that their government missed the, poor, missed the trick here, and they should have came and worked together with people. I think when you go outside of that, whilst we have many NGOs in this country, and many people will know that, not all of them really do work with you, with communities and poor communities. I think it's time now to move away from that, from the traditional NGOs, and go to the people on the ground, and we are willing to cooperate and work together with the department to ensure that. Those in need really get the food parcels. I've seen people cry tears. I've seen family cry tears. I've seen children cry tears because they go to bed without food. I think this has to stop. We need to come with a new direction. We need to come with a with sure, surety that those, on the, those that suffer the most, those who are impoverished, they really get food to them. And that's what I, I think is the best idea, the best way forward. And my details are available. I'm willing to put my shoulder behind the wheel because, and I don't need to get paid for it. I don't want money to get into any one of our pockets. I think that the poor and the suffering of this country need to be addressed and they need the food parcels and they need it urgently. So I think there's, there's other points coming up related to this from the chat uh, stream. Uh, so there's the point about informal traders. This is very, very important. We have mentioned this as part of unlocking the commons. And again, there, there are levels of organization amongst informal traders. They can easily be networked uh, into a local-based partnership, into a national-based partnership, working with the Solidarity Fund, working with the government, and they can be very, very crucial challenge, uh, channels. The other thing that's come up, uh, or maybe not enough of, is the schools. I mean, 9 million children get a hot meal in schools. And that has just been shut down. And so again, here's another stream uh, that government can think about activating within public health guidelines, et cetera, to make things happen on the ground. Um, I don't know, Anoki, if you wanna say something about some of these ideas that have been coming up and or any of your own thoughts around how we can scale up food relief. So, so I, think, I think one of the, so in terms of, I know there's a lot of questions on the chat as well. And, and so the Solidarity Fund had, just, just a point of clarification before I, I answer your question, is that the Solidarity Fund had initially, um, you know, said that they would deliver, that, that we would deliver 250,000 parcels in the kind of period of the lockdown. And, and we are close to kind of completion of that. And so the question then becomes for us, what is the kind of next round of, uh, of our food of our food program and do it, does it take the form of parcels or does it does it take the form of 
you know, supporting people to grow their own food or, or linking suppliers to, um, to market, uh, does it take, take a form of something else, right? And I think that, that that's, that's kind of what this discussion is really helping, helping us think through. Uh, on the issue of kind of the coordination piece, I mean, I, I think I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the to the issues on the ground, which is that there is concerns around uh, security, concerns around managing, um, you know, um, a number, you know, managing distribution going out to different areas and, and potential duplication, uh, and then and then of course gaps uh, emerging as a result. And I think that there are some perhaps one of the things that we can do is actually use some of these new technological platforms that are being delivered, that are being developed to, to do better coordination. Um, and those platforms exist. I mean, I, I know that Help Out, or, or I guess they're now called Link2, uh, has developed such a platform. Um, but the, those platforms are only as good as, as the number of people who use them. Um, and so if we can kind of decide that we will coalesce around one or two platforms and, and allow us to have a way of seeing where the relief is going and, and how to best direct the relief and where the gaps are, perhaps that could be one way of addressing the problem. I'm aware that, you know, the scale of the problem is, is so large that, um, that we will kind of, that there's no kind of perfect solution going forward. Okay, thanks for that. I think the issue of production is very, very important mm. uh, in, this, in this whole challenge. Household level production, small scale, micro farmers, small farmers um, and including getting uh, small scale fishes to fish again. So can we, can we explore this issue a little bit more? Uh, I mean, what are the challenges? How do, we, how, do we, how do we connect production now to also the food effort in the country and what's standing in the way of that? So uh, where's our friend uh, Tim Abba? Is he, has he disappeared? Okay, oh, that's a pity. Okay, but I'd really like, like, like you to, to give us some sense of this. I mean, Food Flow says they've paid a total of 961,884 to small scale food producers to sustain livelihoods, uh, 300 farmers, fishers, and bakers. And I think that's excellent. Um, Dora raised this question as well about how food is sourced right now, even for food relief. So, so connecting production to immediate food relief but also connecting production um, beyond uh, immediate food relief. I think this is a very central question. And any thoughts around this and how that we, we scale this up? Uh, or how do we support this and enable this? What's coming from practice? Anybody? Um, yes, I can, I can talk about it because um, we've been working with Tim and um, other producers, uh, largely in Gauteng, and I've just been off a call with others in KZN who are working, you know, working on this similar pro approach. Uh, already there are many organizations that are doing this, that are tackling the issue of food provision and attaching growing to it. Uh, the Green Business College together with Tim and others through the Ubuntu program, we have been doing that. Um, and I think it's really important to note that um, this is, you know, we have to capitalize on the, on the issue that we already are reaching out to households. And as, as, as we are going there, really looking at dealing with the immediate food relief issues, we should be building on um, a system where um, they are already growing their own food, meaning providing the resources that Tim was talking about, the seeds, the seedlings, the, 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 the compost, and whatever need that they have, um, you know, really bringing them in as part of the, the, the whole um, you know, uh, the movement of growing their own food and building on local economic development where in the, in the future, they could be able to have food for their own consumption, but they could also be able to sell the excess that they have. Um, it's, it, it, it's something that needs to be thought through, but a lot of organizations are already bringing their heads together. There, has, there is some work that has been done under, this, under the C19 auspices that is mapping the, 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 the small producers in the various areas, um, looking at what are they, producing, you know, what resources do they need, but also looking on the input side, what are some of the, the, the inputs that they need right now for them to be able to continue growing the food that we so much need. Um, and also looking at the access to markets, who are they selling to, um, you know, and, and who, who's there that could be able to support them in this work, looking at some of the government infrastructure, uh, like the agri hubs that have been lay, laying dormant that could be utilized to support the, the smallholder farmers in various areas. Uh, and I think it's, there are lessons that can be learned. 
And this is the work that has been done by many organizations without um, a, a government support that government can be able to, to learn from and build from and be able to make sure that, you know, post COVID, we have, we have uh, these food um, issues uh, being addressed in this way that should, uh, uh, um, should a disaster of this nature hit again, we're going to be having a totally different conversation. I think it is important to unlock the food commons, the, the schools with where, where people have already been growing gardens, the open spaces um, that, that people have been used communally to be able to grow, um, for them to be able to access and to go back to grow, uh, but also to be part of the, of, the, of the supplying of the food that is needed right now, for them to sell to the organizations that Solidarity Fund is funding, to be able to procure from, to make sure that the food that has been given by Solidarity Fund uh, service providers um, has got nutritious vegetables with it you know it's not just food in the stomach it's actually nutritious food and that our people also have a have, you know they have a contribution they can full, feel the pride that they too are not just receiving a handout they are able to participate in, in, in tackling this challenge of COVID-19. They can be able to grow their own food. They can start producing seedlings that they can grow in exchange for money that they need for other resources. Um, so this is something that we have piloted with Tim and other, and other farmers in the area where they are, we are buying from them to provide into their own communities and assisting the communities to start growing their own vegetables right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, we call this pathway building in terms of food sovereignty and kind of anchoring this around hubs and things like that. And for us, the, the time has arrived for this and we are going to be putting a big push into this and we'll continue raising this with the Solidarity Fund. But Des, I wanna bring you in about fishes here. I mean, what quantity of fish, uh, 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 sort of fishing um, is produced by small scale fishes? Uh, where does that go to and, and all of that? Help us understand it because they do feed people in our community. Thanks, can you hear me fish? Yeah. Um, Look, I think the first prize will be that the people get back to fish. They can do social justice. They've been doing it for many years, hundreds of years. And that will alleviate them relying on, realizing, relying on government to give them food because they can catch the fish during this, particular this period, the winter period. As we go into the waters are cold, we have all the, all the sardines on our coastline. They could be catching the sardines, getting the sardines, taking home and putting food on the table. A nice sardine fry is very good and tasty, right? And all the fish that follow the, the sardines on this coastline. So we promote the sardines all over the world for tourism. Sardines can, are very good edible fish for diet, for a dietitian, for people to, to, to feed their hunger. That, that, that is the first prize. So we can get fishermen back, it'll be the first prize. Secondly, there are only 48 co-ops in the country, 48 people in Durban that belong to cops. We're talking about 30,000 fishermen here. So you're not gonna give grocery parcels, are not gonna go to, we we'll, we'll can only feed 48 people if they do get it. I doubt very much they are even getting that. So it's not addressing anything that we are talking about um, to, to alleviate poverty. Thirdly, I wanna say that the, the government should not be coming down with a heavy hand on all our people. Our people have come from huge struggles. They are suffering on the ground. They need the government to open up. And there's no way, if you're fishing, you're going to do, you can apply, you can have all the masks and everything, and you can, uh, you can defend your health needs away from COVID-19. Uh, COVID it can be done, it's been done already. I can't see the difference between the fishing community that fishes on boats and the people who fish on the beach. The, the beaches are empty. There's nobody swimming at the moment. There's no surfing at the moment. So there's a need, they can get the fishermen back. That will cut back on the grocery parcels that they can't afford to give everybody and they're not and giving to the fishermen. That will help a long way to alleviate that. We need to find different ways, as I said in the beginning. This is one way of eliminating poverty amongst our people and giving them dignity. You can't, the, the more the coronavirus goes on, the more people will be affected the more people will be affected with poverty and die from poverty, and we can't have that. I think government needs to be reasonable here yeah? and needs to allow our people to go back to fish, which they've been doing, and which they should do and can do without impacting on anybody's health and well-being. I think that's the way to do it. We are available to work with them on that. And if they want to do the grocery packs, as I suggested, 
that government needs to find a new way. The old way is going back to the very same people and a few people, and it's not going, it's not going to a broader community that really needs food. I think government, yeah, needs to look at that carefully because the groups that they've been working with don't live in the communities and they fail to address the needs of people. And we've seen so many people fighting. There's been so many protests during this period because they're not getting the food. So please, let's not go back to the same way that you've been dealing with. It is a fair way. It has created more animosity and fight and it will and it'll continue with that day if we don't stop and go to the right root causes of it and let's deal with it in a proper informative way so that everybody can benefit, everybody can put food on the table and not only a few people. So, so both Dora and Des have, have underlined the point that if we unlock the food commons, small scale food producers, uh, fisher folk, but also informal traders, you already are feeding people. They are feeding themselves already. Okay. They don't need to be now on lists, et cetera, to be targeted uh, for food parcels. Now, this is, a, this is a big issue. So there's thousands and thousands of fishers. There's about 2.6 million people in informal sector trading and food, et cetera. Um, there's thousands of, of micro farmers, et cetera, hotspots. So immediately people can self-provision food right there. The other point that has come out here is that you can connect this, of course, to food relief because you can link back into these food producers, fisher folks, et cetera, and you can harvest, if you like, or harness their food and channel that into food relief. So in this way, we are also strengthening what has always been peripheral outside of our food system, if you like, but you are building the alternative food system. So I think this is an important takeaway also for the Solidarity Fund. I want us to explore very quickly, given time constraints, the undocumented uh, xenophobia, the exclusion of people from, from receiving food parcels, et cetera. Uh, this has come up in various, various comments, okay? Can we get some perspective on this? Uh, I wanna kick off with you, Anoki. I mean, what has been the experience of the Solidarity Fund reaching undocumented peoples, reaching people um, that are, are not supposedly South African, but living in South Africa and so on. Can we get some input on it? Sure, and, and let me actually also just uh, use this time to, to reflect on the previous, the previous point you made around kind of what is standing in the way of integrating smaller, smaller farmers or small scale farmers and producers into the supply chains. And I think, I think one of the critical issues that we are trying to resolve is in practicality, if, if you're trying to do a large scale distribution, the practicality of actually making those links between supply and market um, needs, needs a lot of effort, right? Um, and it doesn't mean that it can't be done, but, but you know, you've got kind of uneven volumes. You don't necessarily know where the volumes, all the volumes are supposed to go. You need to make sure that there was a truck there to pick up that product to take it somewhere else. Now, all of these things can be solved, but I'm, but, but in the short time frame that, that sort of that, that the work is happening in that, that is, that is something that's a critical, a critical problem that needs to be resolved when you, when you're figuring out the actual logistics of this, right? And the actual logistics are actually quite complicated. Um, doesn't mean they can't be solved, but I, I, I want to, you know, I, I want to sort of belabor that point a little bit because you know we've received requests for you know someone saying oh we've got x amount of produce to donate and then it's in some location and we're not quite sure how to get it from a to b and then the cost of that and then who will be the recipient i mean all those things require it's very very high touch um and so uh you know one of the, that's one of the things that we're really grappling with and trying to think about a solution here um on the undocumented workers i mean our position has been uh, that we do not require an ID for to receive a food parcel. So undocumented workers are receiving uh, um, our solidarity funds food parcels. I mean, the exact kind of proportion of that and, and how we'll be able to identify them uh, will will only be made made uh, clear when we receive all our beneficiary reports in the coming weeks. I, I should also say that it's not just foreign migrants who are undocumented. There are many South Africans who don't have IDs. There are, you know, a, you know, children who might children households who might not have ID. So it's not necessarily just a foreign migrant issue. It's just a, a general inclusion principle uh, that we have followed at the fund. Mervyn, is there any such experience and challenges in Peter Maritzburg around exclusion and so? On? Um, so, Vash, the what we have been seeing. I mean, 
and, 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 and our reach is very, very limited. Uh, um, so I cannot speak for the whole of Peter Maritzburg. But for us, the exclusion really is not so much the issue of um, foreigners versus locals. I mean, for us, the exclusion is the fact that just not enough people are getting uh, uh, access to, to food and, and sufficient food. And that goes right across the board. Um, and, and so that for us is the issue that we need to resolve is how can we get more food into the hands of, of, of a greater uh, number of people. Um, but we haven't really seen in any massive scale, at least from our experience, uh, and, and as I say, our experience is limited, um, around the issues of xenophobia and the exclusion of people based on, on the fact of nationality. Thanks. And, and so therefore I would, I, I think what you had suggested around opening up the commons and trying to connect the commons with, with, with where the needs are, I think that's an area critical for us to explore going forward. Thank you. Tim, you came back. Do you want to say something about small scale farmers and uh, but particularly your relief work? And are you reaching everybody in communities, et cetera? So yeah, from our side, hmm. yeah, we, we, we are trying to reach as many communities as possible because from, until now, we have reached over 700 households. That's like a five for each, 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 each township we go for a hundred households. So we have reached like seven townships and in the coming weeks, if we get support, we might reach up to 500. And then on the issue of foreigners and xenophobia, you know, class. COVID-19, it's affecting the human race. Not the chickens, not the goats, not the crops. It's the people. And if you go on a selective mode and say, I'll give the locals the foreigners I don't, you know, from our experience, from the project, when you go to the communities, the community leaders, they even show you this documented, undocumented, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big debate, but, and most of the people that we deal with, even small farmers, some of them are foreigners, some of them are local. So from the broader point, it's food. Let people eat. Ajabantu and let there be enough during this lockdown. Our people, we got like 17 million people who are suffering from 6.5 from high blood, 6 million from diabetes, 6 like cancer. You know, that's like half of the country got 7.2 million people going to bed on an empty stomach. COVID-19 has left people in their household, there's no income. Let's reach them. We are using the farmers with the produce to reach them. But the government must step in. The private sector must come in and help support this initiative. If we keep putting these red tapes and say, let's have a centralized parcel donation place, we won't reach people, you know. Our people are desperate. And the third world war. It should not be about ammunition, or about wealth, or about money. It should be about food. You can... Tim, we're having problems hearing you. Tim? Tim, we're having problems hearing you. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Um, we have had over 200 participants uh, in this webinar, and uh, thank you to, to all of the participants. Um, we, we couldn't just open it up because we wanted to have a very structured and focused conversation. I must say that there's some very, very important issues that have come up both from the chat stream, but also from the panelists that we need to think about going forward. I mean, the first issue is over-regulation. That's coming through thick and fast. And it's not just rhetoric about clamping down and it's not just rhetoric about tightening the screws, etc. On the ground, there's clearly um, officialdom marching through our societies and it is stopping people from 
from acting on compassion, concern, and solidarity. And that is very real right now. And this, I think, is a common concern and challenge for all of us. This is a recipe for catastrophe in our society. And so going forward in terms of a dialogue with the minister and a dialogue with the Solidarity Fund, which we will be pursuing uh, together with other allies, this is a very, very crucial issue. We have to unblock this thing now. I think the other point to make is that some of the national regulation has been implemented haphazardly, okay? And so, you know, where informal traders are allowed to trade uh, in national regulation under level four, you are seeing local governments do their own thing. And in the main, keeping informal traders out of their economic livelihoods. So again, we've got to sit together. We've got to talk about unblocking this issue now. The other point that's very, very important is around food prices. So the big uh, food value chain producers, the big supermarkets, uh, the 3,000 odd uh, farming, farming operations that really produce the core of the value chain in South Africa, they are pushing up food prices. And this is something we really need to engage on as part of a common partnership. Uh, there needs to be a focus on this issue. Okay, it's adding further to the household squeeze, it's adding to the hunger, it's, it's adding to, to the pushback of people into poverty. So we have to talk to that issue together. Uh, the point about um, dialogue and participation, I think it's very, very important that if we start thinking about a framework, this, this has to break with a centralized mold of doing things and a centralized approach to tackling these challenges. We're gonna to have to think about decentralized partnership. We're gonna to have to think about local leadership stepping up and working uh, with a whole set of institutions, Solidarity Fund, Department of Social Development, et cetera. That space has to be created. Communities understand their needs. Communities understand uh, how to work together amongst themselves. And it's important that we start making these connections. So this ecology exists, it's there, we need to work with it and we need to bring it into the way forward. This is absolutely important. I think the other point that's come out uh, very strongly is, is the role of the Solidarity Fund. And if I understood Anoki correctly, this has been an intervention, a crisis-based intervention. It's been finding its way. It's been trying to use resources as smartly as it can, but it also understands that the challenge is very big. And so in terms of its role, uh, around immediate food relief. I think there's a lot of food for thought coming out of this conversation uh, for how the, the Solidarity Fund should work. I think also how the Solidarity Fund positions in partnership, in dialogue uh, with grassroots communities that has come out strongly in this conversation. I think the other point is around connecting with production and unlocking the food commons. If we unlock the food commons right now, many, many people in this country will be feeding themselves and they won't have to be on an aid list or a parcel list or whatever it is. It also means that food relief can be connected to production, to fishing, uh, et cetera. And I think this is a very, very important issue around the influence that the Solidarity Fund has and it needs to, together with us, start engaging on these issues with government. I think what's also come out very clearly here is that the framework we've been talking about as a South African food sovereignty campaign is shared by many. So whether it's about holding the supermarkets accountable and getting them to price ethically, to also take up solidarity buying, I think that's an important issue. We cannot let them off the hook. I think the point about unlocking the commons, a lot has been said in this discussion. And this includes school feeding schemes. This includes the local street um, a soup kitchen, uh, it includes uh, the small-scale farmers, the small-scale fishers, etc. This is a very, very important issue if we are going to go forward. But the point about the commons is that we need to also ensure that it's part of building the next food economy. It needs to be part of trailblazing around food sovereignty. And this is a very, very important issue, again, that we want to further engage uh, with the Solidarity Fund and government. And I think the third issue that has come out is that we've got to widen the remit of players around food relief right now. And I have said this, but decentralizing, but in a way that brings in local leadership, local dialogue, local participation is gonna be very, very important. And finally, the basic income grant, the COVID relief grant, I mean, Mervyn's figures, et cetera, about households is really coming short. 
So both food as well as the lack of income is going to give us a very rocky road uh, going, going forward. If we do not tackle these two issues, and there are enough answers in these conversations, we do not tackle these two issues, South Africa under lockdown is going to be a very volatile place. Okay? We are not going to be able as a society to rise to the challenge of dealing with the COVID pandemic. People are going to be on the streets because of hunger. They're going to be on the streets because they have no money. So here's a moment where we can work together, build a partnership, build a common framework, and, 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 and tackle the pandemic while at the same time meet, meeting societal needs. Now, this conversation doesn't end here. It's going to continue. So thank you to all our panelists. It is also going to continue after this. We are going to be setting up a meeting with the minister uh, to share this conversation, but also take forward some of the ideas that have been put forward for a common framework. We are going to ask for a meeting with the Solidarity Fund uh, to also further engage and deliberate on these issues. The door seems to be open. Uh, and, and I think we will invite allies so that we work together and, and we move forward together. Thank you to all of you for your time. Uh, thank you to, to, to the participants again. And, and apologies because we couldn't just bring everybody into the conversation. It was a very big audience, but your comments have been noted and, and they're informing our conversation and way forward. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Thank you.